All right, we have a lot of content. We usually wait a couple minutes. Um, we're gonna get going. We have a lot of content to cover today. So I wanna thank everyone for joining us. Um, good morning and uh, welcome to our workshop on healthier homes, why indoor air quality matters. So housekeeping, my name is Doria Estrella. I'm an analyst with the Climate Action and Resiliency Division, formerly the Energy and Sustainability Division. So if you've joined us with, for one of our webinars before, you'll notice that we've changed our division name. So, um, and I'll be your host today and moderator. I've been with the division since 2010 and currently manage the marketing education outreach programs. Prior to my work here, I was in residential construction industry as a project manager and focused on green building technologies, which have come a long way since then. Joining me today is Andy Wall, and I'll tell you a little <laughs> bit about him um, in just a minute. If you have any questions throughout the workshop, um, enter them into the chat. I'll be moderating that, and we will be addressing them at the end of the workshop. <clears throat> Following the workshop, a link to the recording uh, will be sent out to all the participants. And we usually get it out, give us a couple days. It, um, we have to go through, watch it, clean it up a little bit and then get it out to everyone with the slides. If you haven't received it in a couple of days, check your spams or your junk mailbox. A lot of times we end up there uh, because of the way we send it out. And if you still don't have it, contact our office and we'll get it to you. So not many people realize that the county has a climate action resiliency division. And if they do, they don't realize the number of services that we offer the community. We were created, and the Energy and Sustainability was actually created in 2006 to address internal county energy use in order to mitigate climate change through greenhouse gas reduction. And in 2009, the first community facing program was introduced. And that's the Sonoma County Energy Independence Program, also known as Skype. And it's the first and longest residential PACE program. We also offer commercial um, and multifamily, which stands for Property Assessed Clean Energy. It allows property owners here in Sonoma County to finance energy water saving improvements as a tool in reducing <clears throat> greenhouse gases. And in 2020, we expanded that to include wildfire safety and seismic, strength, seismic strengthening. Um, and since that time, we've added a number of resources and services. And in 2021, the board directed that the Climate um, Action and Resiliency Division be created and because of the work that we do around greenhouse gas reduction, it just made sense for us to move and merge with that division. <clears throat> um, our primary focus here is on buildings and behaviors. We assist customers or um, constituents through a variety of services. We work with cities, towns, special districts, businesses, and residences to increase energy efficiency in their buildings, making them more resilient um, through audits, energy retrofit projects, rebates, and financing. Our consultation services provide no cost and partial information to educate the community members so they can make informed decisions on building improvements and make and offer project planning services to help identify resources such as incentives, rebates, and financing to get projects done. We also host numerous workshops and trainings uh, for the community and for workforce development. So you're here, so I'm sure you've seen, you know, if you have it, here's a list of where's second one into our fall workshop series. Uh, today's Healthier Homes, Why Indoor Air Quality Matters. Next week, we have um, Saving Energy at Home, learning about how your house works as a system, heat pumps for residential heating and cooling, uh, funding your improvements. So we're going to be talking about a real in-depth dive into incentives, rebates, and financing, looking at some of the, you might have heard, the new IRA rebates, the Inflation Reduction Act rebates that are coming down from federally. Um, we'll touch on that and give a status update on when we expect to see those and the incentive levels there. Um, and then our last in the series is going to be a solar storage and electrification, a perfect, perfect match. So with the big push for electrification, um, having a, um, being able to be what's called a net zero energy or, you know, producing as much as you use. Um, how that works together, how you can use that for low shifting and, and peak, peak day pricing, that kind of thing. Um, these will come out with your slides, so if you'll have the links, you can also contact our office if you want to get registered for any of them. So with that, I want to introduce Andy Wall. Um, Andy started in building science field in 1980. He attended Jordan Energy Institute to study renewable energy, appropriate technology, and energy efficiency. He has completed more than 7,500 energy analysis 
and over 2,000 ventilation designs, provided technical support and training for energy auditing staff, and consulted on numerous software programs for utility companies. 10 years of computer support, including hardware, database software, and user support. With a passion for energy efficiency and safety, Andy promotes building science everywhere he goes. Certifications include RCS Auditor, BPI, or Building Performance Institute. He and his wife, Kara, own AC Home Performance, Inc., and their home has been retrofitted to zero net energy. So um, with that, I'm going to pass the controls over to Andy, and he can take it from there. Okay, thank you, Dory. Uh, let me get set up here, get my presentation up. Okay, so you can see my first slide? Yes. Okay. So good morning, everybody. Uh, this is uh, has to do with our um, primarily indoor air quality, although uh, it has a lot to do with outside too, depending on the, what's going on in the outside world. So this is my email address and my phone number if you decide you want to get a hold of me. Uh, I will tell you that uh, I did recently retire, although I will probably never retire from this industry, but my full-time job, I've retired from it. Uh, so, and I'm on the East Coast time now, uh, not on the West Coast anymore. So a little disclaimer, uh, no matter what I have in these slides, um, your local code takes precedence to this. Uh, so it's important that you check with your local codes on what is appropriate in your area. Uh, since I did live in California for a long time, I have a pretty good idea what they do there. Although certain local jurisdictions may adopt things that are outside of the normal code. So be really careful with that. Uh, there's some opinions, there's some technical in here. Uh, this is not necessarily the opinion or technical that uh, Sonoma County has, or myself as the presenter, I'm just presenting what's out there. Uh, please do your homework, uh, because this is not a definitive list. This is just, it's really kind of a brief overview. It's to get you pointed in some direction so that you have some idea of uh, ventilation and what might be going on in your house and how to deal with it. Okay? Uh, but some people spend all their life learning about uh, indoor air quality. So this is just a real brief uh, overview. Uh, one item that's really important that people don't normally do and they start is what is the goal? What are we trying to accomplish here? Um, that goal is different for different people. Uh, sometimes it's code only. Sometimes it's people have special health needs, maybe allergies, asthma, uh, multiple chemical sensitivity, whatever it is. So you have to figure out what is your goal and then figure out how to deal with it. Uh, indoor air quality, <clears throat> it's part of um, IEQ, which is actually environmental, indoor environmental quality. So indoor air quality is only one piece of it. There's actually, as you can see, many other things here that have to do with whether the client is comfortable in their home or not. We're just going to focus mainly on the indoor air quality part of it. Um, this here, the air quality index, uh, this is put out by um, the US government. And this is for outside air. Uh, a lot of monitoring, like purple air, will use it actually for indoor air quality also but it is really only an outdoor quality. There are no regulations really on indoor air quality as of yet that may be coming. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, and this is where this comes from, from air now, okay? And this is an accumulation of uh, ground level ozone, particles, carbon monoxide and sulfur dioxide. So it's an accumulation that shows you whether it's safe to go outside or not. And this is a little screenshot. Uh, this actually comes from Purple Air and your air was actually pretty good in your area. So I picked an area that had 
larger numbers, you see the reds in here. Uh, if you zoom in, there might be some purples in here. So there might've been a fire going on down here in the uh, Long Beach, Los Angeles area, where it's closer to the coast, the air's a little bit better. I'm gonna back up to that other slide. You'll see uh, zero to 50 is good. And as the number climbs, it gets to a point where it's hazardous to be outside. And depending on if you're a sensitive group, uh, this might cause you a problem going outside where someone else may not. Um, and this is on uh, the EPA claims that, and this is going to vary, so be careful with this number, but inside our air could be two to five times more polluted than the outside air because the outside air ends up inside, plus we add things to the inside air. Whatever that might be, we breathe, we put water in the air, we buy chemical things, we buy new clothes, et cetera, okay? So when you have a burn event outside, uh, which happens way too often in California, and I was there not too many years ago and went through some really bad ones in the Bay Area, uh, the sky was orange. Uh, there were days you really shouldn't go outside to do anything because it was so unhealthy. And in most homes, that air is going to end up inside the home the way it is. It may be a little cleaner. It may not. It just depends on how much the house leaks. So depending on how sealed the house is and whether the air is filtered coming in or filtered in the house will depend on what your indoor air is like. Give me just a moment here. I need to, oops, I just made it. And let me get this back up here. What am I pointer to stay on here? Okay, so this this is something you can get from Purple Air. You can Google it. Um, um, there's another site I. QA, I believe, is the other one. Uh, and they show these kinds of numbers. People buy monitoring devices, put them in their home, put them outside, and then they get reported. So anybody can look at these if, if the client has turned them on, if customers turn them on. Uh, poor indoor air quality. What can it do to our health? And this is not a conclusive list. This is just... Uh, some of the main ones you'll probably find like asthma triggers, allergies, people feel tired, cognitive function issues. Uh, there are now studies showing that uh, particulate count are actually causing cognitive function issues with people. Uh, you may have be sick more often, irritation to your eyes, nose, throat, headaches, respiratory diseases, and it goes on and on. Uh, so this is important to uh, try to have your air being nice and clean when you breathe it. Um, uh, one of the things for air is being too dry. Things dry out like our skin, our furniture, uh, our bodies don't like it when they're too dry. And you happen to live in a particularly dry climate, so you're going to have a little more issue with that than some places. Uh, cold and dry climates have a big problem with it because the air outside is dry in the winter. Hot, dry climates have a problem with it. So if you have a, if your body doesn't like it when it's too dry, you're going to want to add some humidity to your house. Okay. Um, low airflow on your air conditioning unit. So for those of you that have an air conditioner and it's designed wrong in your climate, the air flows too low, and as it flows over the coil, it takes water out and it dries your house out. Uh, in a dry climate, your air conditioner should be sized appropriately, the air flow correctly. And that means that you probably will almost never have condensate come out of the unit. But in many systems are designed wrong and they're and they're drying out homes. Uh, chimneys, the chimney on the house pull is designed to pull air out. That air that goes out takes water with it and it brings in drier air from outside. Uh, and this is one that I've struggled with for years. Um, all the years I've done energy auditing, 
This is a myth. People think that forced air furnaces dry out air. Uh, forced air furnaces do not dry out air. When we heat air, relative humidity goes down, but the absolute humidity, the amount of water that's truly in the air is still there, it doesn't change. Uh, what will dry people out is if they sit in front of the warm air register, the RH is lower until it gets mixed back into the room, gets back to where it was. What dries out the air with forced air is you have a chimney on a furnace that's pulling air out of the house. You have pressure imbalances almost all the time when people close bedroom doors, leaky duct work. And it's driving this thing up here called infiltration, exfiltration, which is moving air through your house and dries it out. Uh, and you would have to take a look at what's called the psychometric chart. I don't have that on here. Uh, the psychometric chart is the properties of air, and it will tell you all kinds of things about air. Your HVAC people should know about this, but I find most heating and cooling companies. They may have heard of it, but they don't know how to use it or they've never heard of the psychometric chart. Uh, wet air, uh, sometimes our houses are too wet. Uh, if you live in a hot, wet climate, which you do not, uh, you may have high relative humidity, but you don't have hot weather with the high relative, making a lot of, putting a lot of water in the air. But you may have a house that's sealed too tight, and not ventilated properly. You may have a lot of house plants, small house with a lot of people, uh, somebody that likes to take hours and hours of showers every day and no bath fan, uh, cooking with gas. Uh, these are all kinds of things that add water. We breathe, we perspire, and if we put too much water in the house and the surface is cold, it will show up with condensation like this shows here. Uh, air conditioners that are too big and short cycle. Uh, if you're trying to dry the house out with the air conditioner, it won't do that. So it depends on where you are, what your climate's like. Yours, you just have too big of uh, air conditioners typically, but you're not trying to use the unit to dry out the house. Uh, this here, uh, this is a very uh, famous chart in, in my industry that has to do with a variety of things like bacteria, viruses, fungus, mites, respiratory infections, and so on. And if you look across the bottom, this is in relative humidity, and this is where things like it. So what we're, we want our houses, we'd really like 40 to 60, but in a dry climate, 40 is usually pretty hard to accomplish part of the time. So maybe as low as 30, and you'll see like bacteria, they don't like it in here. So you're not likely gonna have a lot of bacteria problems if you keep your house in this range. Viruses, they like it dry and they like it wet. But they don't like it in the middle of the road. Same with fungus. Don't like it dry at all, won't grow at all. But when you get into the high numbers of relative humidity, uh, then it starts to uh, be able to incubate and grow. So this middle of the road, this is where we like to keep our houses. And it would be ideal to keep them there year round. So you don't have the uh, wood in your house expanding and contracting and things changing all the time. And you will be healthier in here, okay? Uh, particulates, uh, that's something I'm sure a number of you are more aware of recently in California than maybe you used to be. Uh, particulates, uh, massive amounts of particulates come off of forest fires. Uh, there's also a lot off of cars driving down the road and wood burning that people do, automobile exhaust, uh, diesel fumes. Uh, particulates come from all kinds of places. Uh, inside our house, just cooking will put particulates in our home. Uh, and you don't, it doesn't matter what fuel you're cooking with, it's food that's cooked on the stove. So it's important to use the range hood. We've got dust, we've got pets in our homes, pests which we shouldn't have. Uh, sometimes people smoke in the house. That outside air that I just talked about 
cuts coming into our homes. It's always leaking in and leaking out uh, unless you have an extremely tight house. Uh, leaky ductwork. Uh, in California, it's very common to have ductwork in the attic and the ductwork. Um, typically ductwork on the average leaks about 30% nationally. Uh, California's probably reduced that a little because of all the duct sealing they've been doing for years, but they still allow duct work in a brand new house to leak 5%, uh, which means if your duct works in the attic, some of the attic air is ending up in your house. Uh, if you have a return up there, if it's a supply, it's pumping air out of your house, which means then air comes in somewhere else. Uh, we bring it in on our clothing, shoes, pollen on our clothes. Uh, old carpeting in the house collects lots of dirt and it breaks down over time. And then there's many other, other reasons for particles to be in our houses. Uh, we spread it around really nicely with our non-HEPA vacuums that when they run, the, the small particulates get exhausted out. Our heating and cooling system are forced air units uh, with leaky duct work, not good filters on it. And then we have our occupants that you know move around in the house. We walk around, disturb things. Uh, so we do a nice job of moving it around the house. Uh, this here, um, this has to do with um, this thing called the D-A-L-Y. Uh, very complicated to explain, so I'm not going to explain how this all works. But what this is about is various things. PM 2.5, that's one of the things for particles. Uh, that is the real um, talk. You see anything that talks about particles, they'll usually talk about PM 2.5. And what this table has to do is um, the quality of your life and the length of one's life will be decreased by some amount because of the various things that are on this. And there's many, many things out there that people look at, diseases, viruses, et cetera. And this particular one, like for example, formaldehyde, a lot of people freak out about formaldehyde and it's not very good for us, it can really make us sick, but it's not as bad as particulates. So particulates are, of all the items on here, it's the worst. Uh, it's even worse than ozone. Uh, so we need to really pay attention to uh, PM 2.5 and try to keep that out of our, our air that we breathe. Uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, carbon dioxide is something that uh, some of you are probably familiar with. That's the... Uh, number that we're all concerned about on the planet that keeps raising, that, that uh, supposedly is warming up the planet. Um, we humans also exhale it. Our pets exhale it. So when we go into a space, the bedroom, uh, the house, um, we exhale, we start adding it to the, to the space. And if we don't ventilate the space, this number gets higher and higher and it causes us issues. Um, it's questionable on some of the issues. Uh, you're gonna see lots of uh, comments out there that high CO2 causes cognitive function issues, being tired, being sick. Uh, there's some people done research now that say it isn't. They say it's the other things we exhale. Uh, and we just haven't, as a society, we haven't done enough testing to figure it all out. But nevertheless, CO2 is the surrogate. If it's not causing the problem, it comes with something else that's the problem. And we need to keep its level down to keep those things down. Um, we put out quite a bit, uh, depending on uh, many, many things. I'm actually building a spreadsheet that's including all of these things. It's whether we eat how much protein, fats, carbohydrates, our weight, our age, our height, our activity. Um, there's many uh, temperature space we're in, the barometric pressure, many, many things depend on uh, how we process what we eat. 
and what we put out for CO2. Um, and you're gonna see more and more of it uh, being a concern. And this is what gets monitored because CO2 is actually uh, pretty simple nowadays, not too expensive to monitor it, to change ventilation. Okay, this here uh, CO2 study, this was, uh, you can look this up. This was from a, a, a Vermont group. They have a, a very extensive energy efficiency, a lot of education. Uh, and they took a number of houses, 22 houses, and they monitored the CO2 in the bedroom with two people in it. Uh, these houses were tight homes, considered tight, which is uh, less than three air changes per hour. And then the others were over three air changes per hour. Is this group. And one night the bedroom door was open and you can see that the parts per million in CO2 was in the, in the thousand range, 1500 range grouped in here. With the bedroom door closed, you can see it was much elevated in many of these. A couple of these uh, were homes that had, there were two of these houses actually had controlled ventilation in, the rest did not. Uh, and you can see the same thing happen both nights with the door closed, we had uh, upwards in the three, 4,000 and what's interesting is the leakier homes actually showed higher numbers. Now we have to be careful of that because if the house was leakier, that doesn't mean the bedroom was leakier or there was no data on the people, what they weighed, how old they were uh, in the bedroom. So that could be, these could have been uh, people that were heavier, the right middle age group that produced more CO2. But nevertheless, what this shows us is we get into some really high levels of CO2 in the bedroom when we put two people in it and close the door for the night, even in leaky homes. So in the business I was in uh, the last six and a half years of ventilation, uh, my answer to people is when they said, oh, my house leaks a lot of air, I don't need to ventilate it. Just don't go in the bedroom and close the door and you might be okay. Uh, carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is a whole different gas. Um, it's colorless. It's odorless. Uh, it gives people flu-like symptoms in low levels over long periods. And in high enough levels for long enough, it can kill people. And depending on its concentration, people can die in seconds if it's high enough. Uh, if you walked into a room with an elevated, very high elevated CO2, by the time you figured out that you might be feeling dizzy, uh, it might be too late to actually leave. You might fall down and that's it. So this is a real big problem. Um, it ends up in our homes by things like backdrafting appliances, plug chimneys, pressure problems in houses. Uh, Plugged vents. Um, people do things like uh, automatic star car, car starters in their garage to warm their car up in cold weather. And the garage is attached to the house, and there's penetrations almost always between the house and the garage, and we end up with issues. Or we have power outages, and people put the generator in the garage because it's cold weather or raining outside. And those little engines produce massive amounts of carbon monoxide, way more than the big engines with catalytic converters on them, uh, and people die. Okay? So it's really important to pay attention to this. These two uh, meters or monitors here, these two are two of the three or four that are available in the United States now that are low level monitors and they're actually illegal to use in most states because they don't meet the UL listing. But the ones with the UL listings that people buy uh, allow 70 parts per million for 240 minutes before alarming. These start out at about five, six, seven parts per million and start letting you know something's going on. And if the number goes up, their warning goes up with it. They're much more expensive. Um, I suggest people buy all the legal ones you're required to put in your building 
and then you may choose to get one of these per floor maybe and put in uh, that tell you if something low level is happening for long periods of time. Uh, carbon monoxide again. Uh, the new stats on this, they figure there's about 430 people a year die in the United States from carbon monoxide poisoning. Now that includes everything from uh, whatever it might be, death. It's not always in the home. Uh, they figure there's about 50,000 people visit the emergency department every year from CO2 poisoning. And then we have this other number that's unreported. Uh, there's, uh, I just watched a webinar from a company, an HVAC company or monitoring, uh, they were doing monitoring. Uh, they found a lady that had been, she'd had the flu for 10 years and come to find out it was the water heater spilling. I've got a colleague in Kansas City that had a guy that for seven years, he'd been going to the doctor, always sick, always sick, always sick come to find out his water heater was dumping all its exhaust into his house. So if you've got uh, long-term flu symptoms, you need to be asking other questions than just, oh, I have the flu all the time. It doesn't mean it's seal poisoning, there's other things, but uh, you could be one of these people in the unreported uh, and just live with it. Uh, red blood cells. Um, when, when they have a choice between carbon monoxide and oxygen, they will always take carbon monoxide. They, they will not take the oxygen. They will pass it. Uh, and then you're, it builds up in the carbon monoxide builds up in the blood. Uh, VOCs, volatile organic compounds. Uh, we have lots of those today. Just go to any uh, grocery store, hardware store, big box store, look at the shelves, the things that are on the shelves for things like cleaning, perfumes, air fresheners, et cetera. Uh, uh, we produce massive amounts of that. We bring it home, we spray it around and it ends up in our house. Okay, uh, new clothing, finishes, plastics, synthetics, carpeting, furniture, and there's many, many others. Um, you're not gonna get away from it. There's, uh, there's something synthetic in your house, whatever it is. Uh, you want to stay away from it as much as you can, uh, but you'll never totally get away from it in our society today because we have so much of it. Uh, mold. Mold's a visible moisture issue. Uh, and in my industry, we can't walk into your house and tell you you have mold or, or asbestos. Uh, in order to tell you that, you actually would have to have a test done to verify it. Even though if you look at this picture, this is pretty obvious that this house has mold in it. Uh, you can see this person has a hazmat suit. Uh, this, this house probably should be just demolished. Uh, apparently this is a real house somewhere. Uh, this actually happened too. I've never seen it like this, but I've seen some pretty bad mold in ceilings and walls and behind furniture, closets and back corners of closets. Uh, because it's cooler there, RH is higher, relative humidity is higher. And if relative humidity is high enough, uh, as you can see here, to incubate mold, you need the spores. And the spores are everywhere. <clears throat> Doesn't matter how clean your house is, uh, unless you live in a, a sealed tank that's ex extremely well filtered, there are gonna be mold spores everywhere. They need a food, which is an organic matter. They need the right temperature and guess what? That's the kind of temperature us humans like to live at. They need oxygen, which is what we breathe, right? So you're not gonna take the oxygen out of your house. They need a time for all this to come together and they need moisture. And moisture is the one that we can control. Out of all these things, this is the one that we get to control. So if we keep the relative humidity low enough, below that about 60% number, we should never have mold growing in our houses. Okay? And it takes about 24 to 48 hours to incubate the first time. And once it starts growing, if it's only partially dormant, it takes less time the next time around for it to actually
actually uh, to activate again. So if you dry a bathroom out really well every day, get it below that 60% mark every day, uh, you should never have mold growing in your bathroom. Uh, bacteria, uh, this is a little out of my league, uh, but in general, it needs warm, moist, a protein-rich environment, pH neutral or slightly acidic. And as uh, most people I hope know is that not all bacteria is bad, only some of it. So we don't want to start trying to sterilize everything in our houses, which some people do, and then they end up killing all the good bacteria. There's lots of good stuff out there. Uh, viruses, same thing. This is I'm not a big expert in viruses, but they infect living cells in humans, animals, plants. They need, they need a host to, to survive. They don't survive well very long on their own. And good filtration uh, can get rid of them. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some other things in a moment. Uh, there's other things. We have pets in our homes. We have pests. Um, I was just absolutely couldn't believe what I saw in California after most of my career was in Michigan and Ohio doing energy audits. I've been in many, many houses, many thousands of houses. And I saw mice once in a while, uh, trails, little rodent droppings, uh, but not excessively. When I moved to California and started doing uh, home performance diagnostics in California, it didn't matter the price of the house, the neighborhood. Uh, we, we saw more houses with rats problems than we saw without. And I've been in many multi-million dollar houses that the rats were chewing up the flooring and living in the crawl space having heyday. Um, so you need to look, you know, whoever does your work on your homes uh, needs to be aware of how rodents get in and what size of hole it is and be able to fix those. You need to keep the rodents, whatever they are. If you don't want them in your house, they're a pest and you need to keep them out because uh, uh, there's a research project was done. Um, one of the only ones I've ever seen, they claim that a house in a heating dominated climate, which is California, by the way, most of it, um, if you have a crawl space in your house, about 40% of the air that you breathe comes from your crawl space. And Almost every crawl space I've ever been in, I sure don't want to breathe the air from it uh, because of the soil gas, the uh, things we spray down there for pests, the mold, the, the rodent droppings, et cetera. So it's a real nasty place. Uh, smoking, radon. Um, you don't have a big radon issue, although they're finding more of it uh, because if you look at the radon maps, they're only based off of where the it's been found and most of California doesn't have a lot of radon issues, so people don't test. So it has, it's not on the, not on the radar, but radon comes from the ground, it's a soil gas. And you could have a hundred houses in a neighborhood with no problem and one with a problem. Uh, the rodents, the asbestos, and then there's other things. Uh, how to fix, um, we need to, Absolutely, the very first way to fix the issue is to get rid of it, take it out of your house. Um, uh, that is uh, not easy for some people for certain things, uh, but there are a lot of things like if you have someone that smokes in the house, uh, they need to smoke outside, you know, don't do it in the house. Um, if you can get rid of some of the chemicals, get the rodents out of the house, get it out. The next way is spot ventilation. And this is what we see like a kitchen range hood, uh, bath fans, those are spot ventilation, they vent the room it's in. Uh, if you have a hobby that you use a lot of toxic things, uh, you might wanna do a lot of uh, an exhaust hood where you work under it when you run the glue gun or the soldering or whatever it is you're doing that's very toxic, you get it out. The next is dilution. Uh, dilution is where you keep taking out 
polluted air and replacing with uh, less polluted. Uh, it may not be not polluted, but less polluted uh, to try to dilute it out. And then we have air scrubbing where you use uh, filters, you use activated carbon uh, to remove things that are in the air that you don't want. So remove it, right? If it smells like this pile of manure in the house, uh, you can ventilate all you want and you're not gonna get this house to smell better. You gotta get this thing out. Uh, this actually is an air freshener. A lot of air fresheners are actually pollutants. Uh, not all, but what they do is deaden our scents and they add something else to camouflage this that's in our house. So be careful. Things we spray, what's the propellant in it, uh, candles, fireplaces. Uh, I've looked for years at fireplaces and this one's pretty extreme, it's black, but you'll almost always see a fireplace that gets used at all. Over the years, it will start to turn black on the front. And that means it's been spilling in the house, uh, cigarette smoking. Uh, here's an example of spot ventilation. So this person has a cat and they don't want the smell of the litter box. So they put a small fan, a duct, and they duct it outside. Uh, in my six and a half years, I've got three jobs now, only one that was actually finished while I was working for the company that the client put a in the laundry room, one of the cabinets had a litter box in it. We put an exhaust for the ventilation system into that cabinet. They cut a hole through to the hallway and the cat uses the litter box and they don't smell it in the house. Um, spot ventilation, um, how much do we need? Um, ASHRAE is the organization that most people point to. Uh, these are various versions, 6289 uh, seldom gets used anymore. 62.2 uh, is what many people talk about, but they always forget to put which year it is. Uh, this one was dramatically different than these. These are just little increments. Um, this uh, 2022 is the newest that's out there now. Uh, but not many jurisdictions have adopted it. Uh, your Title 24 in California, that's your code, has adopted the, um, actually the 2019 version is what's coming up. So your 2022 building codes have adopted the ASHRAE 2019. There's also an International Energy Conservation Code uh, which looks at ASHRAE. There's Passive House Institute, US, BIAS, and PHI, Passive House International, or Institute, that's an inter the international version of it. Uh, they all have their own, although these guys actually, BIAS uses uh, ASHRAE 62.2, uh, and it should be the 2019 version. 2016, probably right now, they'll probably change it to 19. This uses different, and I don't know. You'll, if you're doing a passive house, your consultant will do these numbers for you. Uh, so what does ASHRAE say on spot ventilation in a bathroom? Uh, 20 CFM, 24 seven. Uh, the fan has to have a sound rating of one sewn or less, so it can't be any louder than that. Uh, in a kitchen, or I'm sorry, or you can do a 50 CFM on a switch that the client gets to turn on and off, that's a demand switch. Um, and it can be three zones in sound, be a little bit louder because it's not on 24 hours a day. California though, changed this. So in your balanced ventilation, which is your 24 seven ventilation, the heat recovery must have a boost switch for a higher amount of ventilation for a period of time, usually uh, uh, 30 minutes to an hour is what most companies will probably do. Uh, or a humidistat, so if the relative humidity goes high enough in the bathroom, that the fan will go up in speed until the humidity goes down. Uh, the other thing that uh, California does not allow, they no longer allow a 
bathroom window to substitute for actual a fan ventilating. So you can't do that anymore. Uh, older houses, if you're not doing any work on them, any major remodeling, uh, that's all grandfathered in. You wouldn't need to change it. But if you do any extensive remodeling, at some point, they will require you to put a fan in the bathroom. Okay. Uh, oh, and also a bath fan, this 50 CFM minimal uh, in California has to have a humidistat. No ifs, ands, or buts. It's required. Uh, kitchen ventilation, uh, a non enclosed kitchen. That would be the like the great room kind of kitchen or a more open kitchen. 100 CFM minimal, and then based on the BTUs of the cooking appliance, the gas stove, gas oven, you may be required to put more in. Um, enclosed kitchen, that means it has a door on it separated from the house. And there's a square footage number. Um, if you're going to do one of those, your consultant should have ASHRAE. They should be able to look it up and tell you if you can use the five air changes per hour. If it's a downdraft range hood, 300 CFM minimal, uh, three zones is what it, these range hoods are all allowed to produce in sound, which is very, which is audible. Sorry about that. Uh, you will hear that three zones. Uh, and then in the CA Title 24, all cooktops, ovens, or stoves need a hood venting to the outside regardless of what fuel source you use. Okay, so um, I had a lot of clients with uh, in doing induction cooktops, but code still says you have to ventilate because there's particulates come off the food. We still need to get that out. Uh, dilution, dilution's the same, same California Title 24, ASHRAE, the International Code, uh, FIAS, PHI, it, it, they all have their own requirements for that. So you have to know what, where you're building and what you're building, under whose standard, okay? Uh, this is actually an HRV or ERV that uh, it's gonna be very common in people's lives now because more and more jurisdictions are requiring it. Or in, for example, in California, people that wanna build a glass house and can't get their house to pass the code, they can get credit for putting a balanced heat recovery ventilation in and maybe get their house to pass. Uh, dilution, these are numbers um, that ASHRAE, the, the 62 2019, it's the same as 2013, 16, 19, and 22. They're doing 3% of the floor area and then the bedrooms, you figure out how many bedrooms. So this is the formula. This is what the letters all mean. So for example, I have a 2,000 square foot house, three bedrooms. I take 2,000 square feet, multiply it by 3%, gives me 60 bedrooms plus one. I take three bedrooms plus one is four times seven and a half gives me 30. I add these up. So my house that I'm building in California would need 90 CFM minimal for a whole house ventilation. And why a basketball? Well, a basketball is approximately one cubic foot. So every minute, 90 of those are going to come in and go out of my house if it's this house. Uh, let's see, you can get an infiltration credit if you do a blower door test. Uh, and it's the house is a certain leaky rate, leakiness rate. You can get some credit towards the whole house ventilation so you don't always have to put all of the ventilation in. But we should be building tight enough that this would never be allowed. We should build really tight and control what goes in and out of our house. Uh, air scrubbing, hope I'm okay on time, 221, okay. Uh, your heating and cooling system, that goes on your ductwork, circles the air round and round through the house. We have standalone systems that people buy today that parked in the room. And then we have our ventilation systems that have some kind of a filter on them. Uh, particularly between somewhere between a MERV 1 and 16 or some kind of HEPA filter. 
Uh, be really careful. A lot of companies advertise HEPA, but it's not really truly HEPA. A true HEPA filter has very small holes and it. it takes a lot of energy to push the air through it. So there aren't many really true real HEPA filters that don't take a lot of energy and may also be very noisy. Uh, but we see today, uh, California, you have to have a MERV 13 on your, your air handler. That's your furnace air conditioner. Or if you have a ventilation system pulling from outside, you have to have MERV 13 minimum. We have activated carbon that takes gases out. Um, this one here is very controversial. And I apologize if I step on anybody here. Uh, electronic devices are not validated by the EPA. Uh, that's things like UV, electronic air cleaners, precipitators, ionizers, and other things. Um, there's not enough research uh, to, to know what these actually do. Uh, so be really careful with them. This is not from me. This is from other sources. So be careful with them. Uh, monitoring, there's lots of different uh, monitors out there today, public versions uh, for all kinds of things that you want to monitor and see if you have a problem in your house. Uh, be a little careful. Um, they can be expensive, a couple hundred dollars to maybe $500. It might measure three things, five things, one thing, whatever it is. Um, consumer grade versions. Uh, show things are changing. They may tell you that, oops, you have a problem going on. Do you need to try to do something about it? But they're not actually for research. They may not be really accurate. They just may be in the ballpark. Not to say they're bad, just you need to take it with a grain of salt than to what you're getting off of it. Uh, these are a bunch of links to a variety of things that are in this presentation and many more things. Okay. And then we will open this up to questions and see if I have an answer for you. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Andy. That was some great information. So thorough. I really appreciate you joining us. So I have the questions up in the chat. Um, we don't have any just yet, so if anyone's out there and they have some questions you want to ask Andy, um, we're really lucky. <laughs> I happen to come across Andy. I've known Andy for several years. We used to do some trainings here um, for contractors on whole house energy auditors, and he did some of those trainings. I think, Andy, what was that, back in 2012, maybe, maybe uh, 2011? Probably uh, back that far back. Yeah. yeah. I started training in California about 2007. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's he's a wealth of knowledge, and so if you have your questions now, is, now is a great time to get a hold of him. So no questions. I did that good. Oh, we we do. <laughs> I do have a couple. How detrimental is gassing when? Installing closed cell insulation is off gassing. I'm sorry. How detrimental is off gassing when installing closed cell insulation? Okay. So this is, I will be very upfront. This is out of my league. Um, I know some things about uh, closed um, spray foam insulation. Um, when things go really good, everything's okay. And if things go bad, um, I, I know of a case in Reading where a, a guy had his house spray foamed and the factory rep was even on site and he couldn't move into it. He, he, he got sick. He had it tested and it was off the charts in toxicity. They even removed all of the insulation from the house and it still was off the charts on toxicity. And the last time I saw him at a conference, uh, he wouldn't disclose what the uh, agreement was, but the spray foam company came to an agreement with him and his house was leveled and hauled down south somewhere in California and put in a toxic landfill. Um, 
The other part of spray foam is I totally get why people do it. Uh, it, it, saw, it's, it fits in nooks and crannies, and if it's done right, can do good air sealing. If done wrong, it won't. Um, but um, my concern in large quantities is long-term exposure. I, it's a big experiment we don't have answers to yet. It, it may be your children or grandchildren may have the answer to. I don't know. And I, I know that's not a good answer, but it's the one I have. Um, next question is, how do different insulations affect indoor air quality? Different insulations? Mm -hmm. um, well, most insulation, um, if it's sealed in a cavity or in an attic where people don't go and disturb it, and you have a very airtight envelope, it should have no effect on your indoor air quality. When it affects your indoor quality is examples where duct work is leaky. Um, and I, I presented a number of the national numbers, 30% duct leakage. In California might be a little better. Um, I've done about 300 full home performance diagnostics in California. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but this is two or three people spend a day in the house and diagnose, test figure things out. Um, we almost never saw 30%. We had stuff we couldn't even measure uh, with a fan that moves 1200 CFM. We had uh, extrapolated numbers that leaked more than the air handler was designed to move. Um, so where people have indoor air quality problems with insulation is when the ductwork runs where the insulation is and it leaks and it pulls air into the house or the pressure imbalances the house because of an air handler, because of a range hood, because of the dryer, the bathroom vent fans and exhaust, uh, pull air in from unwanted places. That, that's where you're gonna have problems, but um, I don't, unless it's got formaldehyde, but a lot of companies are getting away from the formaldehyde today. So I don't think unless you're hypersensitive to something, most people should not have any issue with most insulations today, okay? Okay, thank you. Um, we have an air purifier that goes red in quotations a lot of the time, but doesn't seem to follow any patterns. We tested the air outside and there's nothing wrong with it. Okay. But it's your, it's your monitor in the house apparently is the question, it goes red. Um, and if you take it outside and it doesn't do that, um, I guess my first question is, um, how extensive of what's going on in the house have you looked at? Um, um, I know that every time we cook, um, it changes our monitor, uh, in the house we're in now. Um, and I have a little apology. My, my bio is a little bit off. Our wonderful air filtered house in California, we sold and now we're starting over again with another house in Michigan. Um, and things, things now are, we're fixing things on it, but at present there's an electric stove and no range hood. And every time we cook, the particulate count goes really high in the house. Um, and then it goes down shortly afterwards because I'm scrubbing the air extensively inside. Soon we'll have a range hood and a whole house ventilation system and so we won't have that. So I don't know. It's, it sounds like you've got something that happens in your house. If your monitor's going off in the house occasionally and, it, and you take it outside and it doesn't do that, there's something in your house. But what it is, I don't know. You might want to hire a professional company to come in and test that has better equipment and tests for more things. Yeah, the participant comment, there's no cooking. It happens frequently when things are relatively static, no movement or additions to the environment. So maybe this- Yeah, I don't know. That's, that's uh, you, you need to probably hire the professional. Okay, and then the follow-up to that is who can, who's the best way to, how, how do you find someone to talk about indoor air pollution issues? 
what would you search or who would you go to? Um, Alex uh, Sadler, I think. He's been in it for years. He's in the Bay Area. That's what his company does is they test uh, indoor air quality and find solutions for people. He's in Marin County somewhere. Um, af after this is over, I will provide his company contact information. Okay, great, thank you. And okay. let's see, what is the best treatment for, in, for the ground in crawl space to prevent rodents and radon penetration? Oh, <laughs> uh, so uh, these are kind of separate. Uh, rodents into crawl spaces, um, unlike where I live now, uh, we're required a minimum of a 42 inch footing in the ground to build a house on. So that means we have to go down 42 inches and there's not not that there aren't, but there's not a lot of rodents that will dig down 42 inches and under the footer. Where in California, you have shallow footings. So rodents will dig under that. Um, so, so you've got to figure out, are they digging under the footer or are they getting in somewhere else? If they're digging under the footing, um, your solution might be what's called a rat slab. Rat slab is where they come in and they put several inches of concrete on the ground in the crawl space. So that the rodents, they may be able to dig up underneath, but unless they spend generations and generations of gnawing away at the concrete, um, they won't get into your crawl space. Uh, but many times, the, the, most of the houses that we went into that had obvious uh, rat problems in the crawl space. Uh, it was because maybe, I'm gonna blame an a, a, a industry here. The uh, client had an air conditioner put in and the company came out and put a great big hole in the vent and left a nice big hole for the rodent to get through or the swimming pool company or the uh, cable company uh, poked a hole someplace bigger than they needed. Uh, so a full grown roof rat uh, and I'm assuming that might be your rodent problem because that was notorious in California. It, it is a notorious problem. Uh, they're about eight inches long without the head and tail, and they will get through a hole the size of a quarter. <clears throat> so you need to really be diligent, and it might take a, a good light and a mirror and standing on your head and digging around and looking everywhere and seeing if there's a hole somewhere. And you need to plug that hole with something that they aren't likely to chew through, like quarter inch hardware cloth. Uh, if you just spray gun foam in it, it's probably not gonna stop them. If they really want in, they'll chew through a piece of wood actually, uh, or if they chew at it long enough. Um, so you gotta, what's the rodent? And you gotta be uh, like a detective and you have to start looking and figuring out the problem. The radon, um, radon uh, is a soil gas. Um, so it comes up through the soil. Uh, it depends on what the barometric pressure is. It depends on what's going on in the ground around you. Uh, but the earth breathes day to night, temperature changes, barometric pressure changes. Uh, the typical solution for radon is a, um, a pipe system that's put in the ground. Uh, usually this is done in areas that have big problems with it. They, if you build a new house, they will make you put in a, uh, it's probably a PVC pipe with holes in it. Uh, it runs around uh, the inside uh, under the slab. It gets piped to the outdoors. And then after the house is built, they test for radon. And if it tests high enough, then it's required to put the fan in and evacuate sub slab. Um, other things that are that help with radon is sealing, sealing the bottom, uh, a, a nice thick piece of plastic with no holes in it, 
it's got sealed seams and sealed to your uh, your concrete wall around the crawl space. Uh, those are those are things that people do to reduce the radon. Uh, another thing that causes a problem, we have a, a a guy out there in the industry that tried this out and went, oops. He did measuring extensively of radon in his house, and every time he turned his bathroom fan on, it went off. So exhaust ventilation will increase the radon in your house. So that 400 CFM range hood or 300 or whatever it is, or 800 CFM, the dryer that's a, about a 100 to 150 CFM, the bath fan that's anywhere from nothing to 150, 180 CFM, all of those, every time you turn them on, will depressurize your house, which may be sucking soil gas into your house. Okay. There's my answer for that. All right. Looks like we have two more and then we're going to wrap it up. Let's see. Okay. Um, would steel wool stop rodents come through holes? Uh, I don't know. The claim is yes. Uh, supposedly copper is the thing to use. Um, I don't know if steel wool will work or not or whether it's a wives' tale. Um, when I wanna plug a rodent hole, um, I use something like quarter inch hardware cloth or something more substantial metal that I will maybe crush up and push in the hole and then seal it with caulk or gun foam. So they might chew the caulk out, they might chew the gun foam out, but when they hit the, the, the thicker metal, they're not likely gonna chew through that unless they spend many generations chewing on it. All right. The last one was just a comment that there was a lot of noise coming through. So I probably should have muted some. I apologize. I am working in, in the middle of an office. So um, sometimes we get some background noises. So I'll keep that in mind. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And um, Andy, were you going to provide that contact information when we send out the slides? Um, we can, let, if you give me a minute, I'll just, I'll look him up. Okay. Uh, and then I can share that or put it in the chat, whatever's easiest. Share your screen. Um, yeah, his yeah. name, let's see. So chat, let's see if I can do this. You might have to switch it to sharing with everybody. Host and panelist, everyone. And then everyone, yeah. I don't everyone. know the name of his, uh, maybe it's Four Seasons George Show. Um, and if you want to find it, and then we can send it out with the slides, that would be fine too. Oh, I have it. I'm typing it in right now. Okay. And for the person that asked that question, uh, there's not a lot of companies that have been doing monitoring, more getting into it, but there's not a lot of them out there. And while you're looking, I'm going to unmute. We have two callers in, and I just, that have called in and, and are, aren't online. So I'm going to unmute them and they can unmute themselves and see if, if they have any questions. Okay, so I just put Alex in the, uh, in the chat. Okay, and for the callers that are on the that don't aren't seeing it, it's Alex Statner. It's S T A D T N E R, and the number is four one five seven eight five seven nine eight six. And yeah, again, he's probably I, been he's probably been doing this for at least twenty years. I would say. Right. All right. Well, I will include that number in the slides when we send them out. Um, if you have any other questions, you can get in touch with us um, and you'll have, I believe Andy, you included your information on the first slide. Mm -hmm. So that will go out to you. And um, yeah, thank you for joining us and everyone have a great day. Andy, thank you very much. Okay, thank you everyone. Bye -bye. Take care.